I wanted to write this book, one, because the, the Bible demands that we do mentoring. So if we want to be faithful to the scriptures, then, then we need to do what the Bible says. And that means we have to teach people how to invest their lives in somebody else. My prayer is that this book will, will convince people. I have to be a mentor. I have to be mentored. I have to do this if I really want to walk with Christ. And I hope that the book will give us ways to do that. I don't want it to be just Bible and theory. I want it to be Bible, I want it to be theory, but I also want it to be practical. How do I do this? How do I find a mentor? What does mentoring look like? What's the plan? What's the strategy? What are the kinds of things that I need to be aware of that, that might be a problem? So I, I want people to be able to pick up this book, work through the study, come out saying, I know why I need to do this, I know how to do this, and I really have to do this because the Bible demands it. My name is Chuck Lawless, and mentoring has changed my life. The book he was speaking of is this, Mentor, which is the book we're going to be using in our new men's study on Wednesday night. In Titus chapter 2, it says, verse 1, but you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be level-headed, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. 
In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good, so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands, so that God's message will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be ashamed, having nothing bad to say about us. Are we supposed to be mentors, guys, and ladies? This is going to be the study for the men on Wednesday night, but ladies, it's also for you. Not on Wednesday night, obviously, but um, mentoring is commanded in the Bible. A simple definition, which Chuck Lawless gives in his book, it says, a God-given relationship in which one growing Christian encourages and equips another believer to reach his or her potential as a disciple of Christ. We all mentor, whether we know it or not. The study just helps us to see how to do it on an official level, not so much official, but it helps us. It gives us some instruction on how to do this. Parents, you're a mentor to your kids. Teachers, you're a mentor to your students. Grandparents, you're a mentor to your grandchildren. People, you are mentors to other people. Let's be that. So, that's our new study on Wednesday night. Enough about the mentor. Now a few announcements. Um, Silver Saints game night on the 19th, which is Thursday night from 5 to 8.30. We also have a men's prayer breakfast on April 29th at 7.30 in the Family Life Center. If you're adventurous and want to get up and help cook, we'll be there at 6 o'clock. Uh, we, will be, we will have a speaker from the Gideons there to speak with us and give us some information on that. Uh, it be a really enjoyable time. Show up, come eat, pray, fellowship. Um, the National Day of Prayer on May 3rd at noon at the Old Chesterfield County Courthouse. If you haven't been there, you've missed it. Um, it is a wonderful time of prayer with our government officials. Yes, believe it or not, our gover government officials pray. And it is a wonderful time there at the courthouse to pray for our nation. If you're a visitor with us, we appreciate you being here. On your bulletin is a, a information card, which I have torn off of mine to use as a bookmark. But on the side of your, your uh, bulletin, just fill that out and put it in the offering plate if you would when it comes by. We'd just like to uh, know you were here, get to know you a little bit better, and say thank you. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we just praise your name today. The reason we are here is to lift you up and to worship you, not for ourselves, but for you. We give ourselves to you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and let's praise the one who forgave our debt and gave us life beyond the grave.
Yeah. 
this was like home. And I'd get my hustle on up and down this whole street all day. Back in the day, David Holland was famous in Norwich, Connecticut. I was always known, I was always there. Drugs and women is how I made my money. Back in the day was four years ago when Sean and Deshni Pillay first came to America. We were newly married and we began to play a walk the city of Norwich. Sean and Deshni came here from South Africa to start a church. You know, a lot of people uh, ask me, are you the missionary from Africa coming to America? And a drug dealer slash carpet cleaner named David was one of the first Americans they met. We were uh, launching our church and we needed a company to come by and to clean our carpets. And as he began to clean the carpets, I began to help him. And I told him about the love of Christ. Jesus can wash you white as snow. That's what the scripture says. It felt like God put his arm on my back and patted me and told me I was going to be okay. Heaven's been on my mind ever since that day. <laughs> Once Sean introduced David to Jesus, David introduced Sean to Norwich. I just began to hang out with him and, and, and walk the streets with him. And, uh, and whenever I was with David, we were always recognized because everyone knew David. Now, Norwich, Connecticut has a church. Sean Pillay is a North American missionary. And David Holland is famous in Norwich for a better reason. My testimony is God's story, which is his glory. This is where I need to be. This is home. Dear church family, thank you for your faithful giving towards the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. It's by your sacrificial giving that we are able to serve here in Norwich, Connecticut and share the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are lost. Also, thank you for your prayers. It is by your prayers and your faithful giving that we are able to serve and see many come to know Jesus here in Norwich, Connecticut. Thank you very much. Um, hi, y'all. Um, I'm Candace, and uh, Annie Armstrong is um, still going on, and the theme is whatever it takes. And um, even if you can only give five dollars, that'll buy like a homeless person a hot meal. So whatever you can give, give it. Um, and I also have some other announcements about the uh, mission trip coming up. We're going to North Carolina, and it's from July 16th through the 20th. And it's only $18 a day, so it's like really, really cheap. And that gives you um, three meals a day and uh, a place to sleep. Um, and it's the um, all the materials that we need down there so it's gonna be really fun and I hope y'all can come and it's a really clean facility and um, it's not a really long trip there so you don't have to sit in a car for a very long time because everybody hates that and um, everyone can do something no matter what your age or your abilities um, we're working with an orphanage and um, battered women and construction so if you don't like kids, work with battered women. If you don't like construction and you don't want to be outside, you know, work with the kids. I mean, come on. So, uh, come. Bye. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we are, we are in awe of you. Lord, we thank you that we can come together to worship you. Lord, we lift your name up here. We praise you. We give you all the honor and glory you deserve. Lord, we pray that what we do here would be pleasing to you. Lord, we pray that we would be cheerful in our giving to you. We pray that the offering we're about to receive would be used for your glory. Lord, we lift your name up here. We lift your name on high. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We 
weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Oh, raise your head, for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens lifted and carried far away, and precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, and live like a new. Be afraid to crawl and remember when you walk, sometimes you fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes away. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was beautiful. Thank you, choir, praise band, especially thank you for today, and thank you for uh, all the time and effort you put into making last Sunday what it was. Uh, a lot of people from the sound to the choir to the special speakers to everything put in a tremendous amount of work into making last Sunday just a very special day, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you did. You did a fantastic job. This morning I was reminded of the, the Jesus Paid It All song. When I was a kid, we, of course, we've sang that. That's an old song. Um, I, I like the new twist we do on it. And, uh, but the, he can change the leper spots. And Chris reminded us to think through that, which I was thinking through that. But in thinking about that, I thought about when I was a kid. When I heard that, I heard, in my little boy mind, I heard ears, I heard he can change the leopards, like a leopard, like running through the woods. He can change their spots. And I always remember thinking, wow, God can... Change the spots on a leopard, which he can, he can. But um, that really wasn't the, the point of, the, um, of, of that particular lyric there. He can cleanse the lepers, the, the people who have skin diseases. But uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Praise Man. Thank you, Adrian. That was beautiful. As you may know, 100 years ago this morning, the Titanic sunk. Today is the 100th anniversary of that tragedy. 1,514 people died in the deadliest peacetime maritime disaster in history. She carried 2,224 passengers. 
her, her pastors included some of the wealthiest people in the whole world and a thousand immigrants from Great Britain and Ireland and elsewhere. Due to outdated maritime safety regulations, she carried only enough lifeboats for 1,178 people, which was a third of the capacity. There was more people that could have been on that ship. Um, come back to that in just a minute. Here's some things you may not have known about the Titanic. Um, five facts that you probably didn't know about the Titanic. Number one, the Titanic had its own, um, its own newspaper. The Atlantic Daily Bulletin was printed daily on board and included news articles, the latest stock prices, horse racing results, society gossip, and a daily menu. They had all that, but they didn't have enough lifeboats. Unbelievable. Um, secondly, on the evening of April 14th, first, pla first class passengers on the Titanic enjoyed a 10-course meal that included oysters, poached salmon, sor sirloin of beef, lamb with mint sauce, chocolate eclairs, water of pudding, and more. And did you know the massive ship, number three, had some unheard of amenities for its day? A Turkish bath, libraries, a squash court, a heated swimming pool, and the luxury liner even had an infirmary with an operating room. While the Titanic boasted some of the wealthiest people in the world on board, two famous men of that era didn't make the trip. Financier, financier J.P. Morgan and famed chocolatier Milton S. Hershey um, had planned to sail aboard the ship's maiden voyage, but canceled at the last minute. Good for them. And lastly, the last remaining survivor of the Titanic died in the year 2009. Uh, Milvana Dean was only nine weeks old and was the youngest passenger on the ship when she was put on a lifeboat and saved. And um, so there's, there's actually more facts there, but I'm going to leave it at that. When, when you think about the disaster that happened that morning, 100 years ago today, 710 survivors, 710 survivors were taken aboard on lifeboats by the RMS Carpathia a few hours later. Same company that built the ship, that built the Titanic, built the ship that came and, and rescued the people that were floating in lifeboats just a few hours later. Many, many, many hundreds of the people were in the water frozen to death by then. They, it only took them a few minutes to die of hypothermia. And what a shame it is to think that the people at RMS or whether, you know, they were within code at the time of how many lifeboats a, a boat of that size needed to have. And isn't it a shame that somebody at RMS, that somebody engineering the Titanic, that somebody along the line didn't stand up and say, no, we're not going to go with the flow. We're not going to meet minimum standards. We're going to go all the way. We're going to go out of our way to make sure there's enough lifeboats. If there were enough lifeboats on that ship, there would have been very little loss. Of, there would have been much, much fewer loss of life. As many of you know, the lifeboats that did come from the ship, many of them were half full. Imagine if somebody had said, you know, there, there was probably three or 400 more people that could have fit on those lifeboats that would not have perished if someone would have said, stop, we're going to inconvenience ourselves. Yes, we're in a frantic hurry. Yes, we're, we're fearing for our lives. But we're going to load these lifeboats to the full. We're going to do everything we can to save everybody we can. Those of you that are churchy type people probably know where I'm going with that, don't you? <laughs> what are we doing to save those that are perishing? What are we doing to make an effort? Which one of us will be the one at the, in, in the organization RMS or one in, in, in the engineering or one in the lifeboat that said, no, stop. There are, there are souls. There are people's lives at stake here. Considering it took two hours to sink, most of the passengers should have been rescued. Most of the passengers should have been rescued on the Titanic. Thank you to each and every one of you that have been involved in Operation Chesterfield and that served at the block party and that served on Easter Sunday and have given of your time. Thank you, who, those of you that just wrote checks or just took money out of your wallet like I did at the last minute and put it in an envelope to help our North American missionaries. Thank those of you <laughs> that tithe and give generously every week so that our church in April is, is ahead of budget, barely, ahead of budget. Thank you for all the ways you sacrifice and serve. You see, serving the Lord comes at a cost, but it's always worth it. And if you turn over to Acts chapter 
16, we're going to see that today. I've entitled my message, Paul and Silas's Excellent Adventure. And you'll see that here. This is Paul's second missionary journey. We are now getting over the halfway point of the book of Acts. And uh, let's do Acts in a snapshot, okay? While you're turning to Acts 16, let's, let's review. Acts chapter 1, Jesus commissioned his followers, and then he leaves. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come, come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. The same commission he gave to them is in effect for us today. He never rescinded that commission. So we should see ourselves as those who can make a difference, who can make an impact, who should inconvenience ourselves, pay the price to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying. Okay, chapter 2, the Holy Spirit indwells humanity. The church begins in Jerusalem. Chapters 3, 4, and 5, Peter and the apostles preach Jesus and stir up controversy. Chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, two of those chapters are dedicated to Stephen, who is killed by men who are under the authority of, of Saul. Ironically, Saul is converted on the way to Damascus, and his life is totally changed. Chapters 10 and 11, Peter has a life-changing vis vision, and Barnabas and Saul reach Antioch, which is a big deal because for, for the first half of the book of Acts, Jerusalem is the headquarters. In the second half of the book of Acts, Antioch, a Gentile city, becomes the headquarters. In chapter 12, Herod kills James, the brother of John, and Peter breaks out of prison. Chapters 13 and 14, Paul's first missionary journey is a success. He goes to the island of Cyprus, and he goes over to Turkey, where he's going to be going back today. Chapter 15, which is two weeks ago, legalism. Legalism is identified and condemned. Now we're in chapter 16. Are you there? What we're going to see is that, is that serving God is costly. It comes with a price tag, but it's so, so worth it. It's more than worth it. And I've divided this chapter into four sections that we'll just read through each section. We'll talk about what it costs to serve God. If you think about it, it cost Paul his head. In the story, in, 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 in the stories about Acts, written by Luke, who is going to rejoin, we see for sure that Luke is with the group here. It cost Luke his medical practice. It cost Paul his head. It cost Barnabas a lot of money, his land. Now, he has gone a different direction than the Apostle Paul, but it cost him a tremendous amount. It cost Adoniram Judson, it, in the last century, his wife, his children, and his freedom. Billy Sunday was a famous baseball player. It cost him his baseball career. He became an evangelist. Of course, none of us would even know who Billy Sunday was if he hadn't left baseball and gone into evangelism. He was the Billy Graham of, the, of, the, um, of, of his day. Kirk Cameron, it's cost him his acting career for the most part in, in secular movies and so forth. And that's just a few examples of, of what it costs to be a servant of Christ. It does cost you something. Today, I hope that we will be honest about that, that we won't shun from the, 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 the realities that following Christ is very costly. In fact, I believe the younger generation wants to know what it costs. I believe that there's a generation coming that is more than willing to pay that price, young and old. Let's be honest about it, what it really costs. First of all, see this. And it's just one word, sacrificing. I'll give you four one-word answers of what it costs. Number one, sacrificing. Sacrificing. Paul visits the churches from his first missionary journey in reverse order. Let's read these first five verses. Sacrificing. We'll see this here in an interesting way. Then he went to Derby in Lystra, where, he, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman. But his father was a Greek, half Jew, half Gentile. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke very highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they tra traveled through the towns, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for them to observe about legalism, literally about circumcision, not having to be circumcised, which they just, he just circumcised Timothy. Now he and Timothy are going through these churches saying you don't have to be circumcised. And, 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 and in chapter 15, which we studied two weeks ago, the Old Testament law, especially the ceremonial law. So the churches were strengthened in faith and were increased in number daily. So let's talk about sacrificing. Specifically in this case, Paul circumcises Timothy. This is not a baby. This is a young man. This is a tremendous sacrifice for a young man. And he sacrifices him in order to more effectively reach the Jews and the Gentiles. And that's what happens. The church grows on a daily basis. Sacrificing. 
It could be something small like that. Of course, I'm sure it wasn't small to Timothy. But making physical, emotional, psychological sacrifices in order to connect people with Jesus Christ. Did you know that all of the engineers on the Titanic perished? Every one of them. They kept it going as long as they could to keep it afloat, as long as it could to get as many people off the boat for as long as they could. 90% of the men in second class perished because they were putting women and children on the boat first. They made a humongous sacrifice. And the application is this. There are things you will need to sacrifice in order to be more effective in every area of your life, in business, at school, sports, and in the Christian life. There's some things you're going to need to sacrifice. Not sins, weights that so easily beset us, things that need to be sacrificed. It's different. It may not be some big wicked evil thing. It may be something the Lord comes to you and says, I'm not going to give this to anybody else. I'm giving this to you. You will make this sacrifice. In our Bible study fellowship classes this morning, we talked about feeding the hungry and the sacrifices that we feel led to make for folks who are in need and our church needs to make to help people who are in need. It's a sacrifice. Jesus Christ is our example. He's the most obvious example of sacrifice. He's, he's the one we follow. He was a living sacrifice, and we're called to be living sacrifices. Sacrifice. Sacrificing. That's the cost. Secondly, the cost is submitting. Submitting. Paul wants to go to Asia and Bithynia, but God says no, and he directs him to Macedonia. Look at verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and were prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. God says no. No. Now, we're supposed to take the gospel everywhere, right? I mean, is there any wrong place to share Jesus? Of course not. But in Paul's travels, and, and he is specifically told by the Holy Spirit where to go. So bypassing Mysia, they came down to Troas. During the night, a vision appeared to Paul. A Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he'd seen the vision, we immediately, notice that word we, that's an indicator that someone else is writing about what's going on. We think Luke is the we, Paul, Timothy, Luke, Silas. We immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to evangelize them. Now, to evangelize them. So here's the question. What is God calling you to do? Circle that word calling. He called us to evangelize. Where is God calling you? Where has God called you? Let's keep reading. There's something very important in this next paragraph I want you to see. Then setting sail from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. The next day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, a Roman city. Now we know big things happened in Philippi because there's a whole book written to the Philippians. It's a Roman colony. It's a big deal. He wanted to go to Asia. He wanted to go to Bithynia. And God said, no, you're going to go to Philippi where he would get beaten. We stayed in the city for a number of days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we thought there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, God was listening. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was spoken by Paul. Now check this out. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she's persuaded us. After they came to Christ, after they were saved, they were baptized. Now, this morning, we're going to do a baptism in just a few minutes. Are you a follower of Christ or are you not? Have you made a public profession of following Christ or have you not yet made a public profession? In the New Testament, making a public profession meant being baptized. Being saved was, you, you could say a private thing, but really it's, it's taking a public stand for Christ. But it's internal. You are saved by grace through faith when you invite Christ into your life when he forgives you of your sins, when he makes you born again, fills you with his Holy Spirit, baptizes you with his Holy Spirit. But I wonder, today, now usually, when, certainly when children come, we have them, if they request baptism, we, we, we actually have them go through the children's department, take, do a few lessons, get some counseling. We want to make sure they know what they're doing before we baptize them. And we, have, we do something similar to that with adults, a little shorter version of that with adults. And, uh, and we'll do that today. We'll give those lessons to any adults that, that, that want to be baptized. But today, in, 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 in this situation, there, weren't any, any, there was no time period. They got saved, they got baptized. If God is calling you, if God is working in your heart, and maybe you've been putting it off to be baptized, I want to encourage you today to come forward and be baptized. 
Now, that probably might sound extremely radical for most people who came to church, you know, not thinking they were going to jump in a pool. Well, we have a robe for you. We have towels for you. We'll help you out. First and foremost, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? You can't serve God until you know God. If you've been saved, have you publicly been baptized? Today, I want to encourage you to be baptized. And what is the cost of following Christ? Well, sacrifice, submission. Jesus Christ was baptized. Why in the world was God himself in human flesh baptized? Well, he was an example. He was submissive to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and in his baptism, you have God the Father, you have God the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, you have God the Son, you have the Trinity right there. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful stuff. Will you submit? Will you submit to Christ? Willingly laying down your agenda, your plans, your dreams, See, they put God's plan ahead of their plan. They wanted to go this way, he said go that way. Submitting to an authority in your life. And of course, the Christian life is all about submitting. Church work is about submitting. Parenting is about submitting. Are you a submissive person or are you automatically more of an unsubmissive person? Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting one to another in the church. We're to submit to one another. Are you receptive when someone gives you a confrontation or are you automatically defensive? Do you have accountability in your life? I thank God for this mentoring session that, that um, Greg Edmonds, it, 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 we're starting this Wednesday night with the men. I hope that you get involved. You know, mentoring is about submission. And, and man, there's a long line of men wanting to do that, right? No, no. But we realize the Christian life involves submission, mentoring, having someone show you how to, how to live the Christian life. This morning when I was driving into the office, I just had my little boy David with me. The others had come before. And, and I said, David, you want to pray for the day? He said, sure, Daddy, I'll pray. And he prayed a beautiful prayer. It wasn't long, but it was big. And when he got done, he said, amen. And then he said, Daddy, I just prayed the things I hear you pray all the time. I just copied you. I said, well, that was a pretty good prayer, David. That's great. What he was telling me is he's doing what he sees me doing. Even some of the bad things that your kids see you doing, they will follow, right? Hopefully more good things like that. He's my little disciple. I'm discipling him. I'm mentoring him. And so are you. Maybe not David, but somebody. And discipleship is about submitting. Following the Lord Jesus Christ is about submitting. Taking your plans, your agenda, your dreams, and saying, you know what? They're not as important as what God has for me, and I'll be better off doing what God wants for me. The cost is sacrificing, submitting. The third one we see here is suffering. Suffering. Things are about to get really, really, really painful for Paul and Silas. Look at verse 16. Are you there? Chapter 16, verse 16. Once we were on our, once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit of prediction and made large profit for her, for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and the rest of us, and she cried out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. How irritating must that have gotten? Paul had a longer fuse than some of us. He had a longer, you know, patience, but greatly aggravated at some point, turning to the Spirit, said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out right away. Why do we think that there was demon possession and de demonic oppression on people in the first century but not today? Why are we so blind to that? Man, we need to open our eyes and understand the, the, the forces of Satan, demonic forces, are all around us fighting against what we're trying to do. Don't be surprised when you get discouraged. Don't be surprised when, when disruptions come when you're talking, trying to talk to someone about the Lord. Don't be surprised when annoyances like this come. They're not just little annoyances. They're Satan busily at work. Well, when her owner saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into market, the marketplace to the authorities. And bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews. Got a little anti-Semitism there, a little racism. They didn't like the Jews. And they are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Roman citizens to, to adopt and practice. Well, Paul's like, man, the Lord led me here. I wanted to go over there, but... The Lord led me here. Shouldn't everything be great? Shouldn't everything be smooth and easy? In verse 22, then the mob joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrate stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had inflicted many blows on them, they were thrown into jail, 
ordering the jailer to keep them securely guarded. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet with stocks. How painful must that have been? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, th that, that is worth underlining right there. That's a bad day, folks, getting beaten with rods, stripped and humiliated. Now they're locked in a, in a dark, cold dungeon in the inner part of it with, with stocks on their feet. But what are they doing? They're singing hymns and praying. And the prisoners were listening to them. That's worth noting for later. Suddenly there was a, such a, a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw that the doors of the prison were open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. He didn't want to have to go through the torture and, and the, the, the merciless penalty for letting prisoners go under his watch. But Paul cried out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself because all of us are here. Who amongst us would have done that? If the, if the doors opened and the chains fell off, I would have been out of there so fast. In fact, I would have probably been stepping on Silas, running over Luke, out of there. That must have been a miserable place to be. And, and, and this kind of goes back to the point of submitting to God. The Holy Spirit must have told Paul, you stay right there. Okay, Lord. So Paul casts out a demon... His reward is being beaten with rods. And even when the cha chains fall off and the doors of the prison were open, he still didn't have the freedom to walk away. Somehow he convinced the other prisoners to stay put. Why? Why? Why did they stay put? Maybe because they heard Paul and, and Silas singing and worshiping God, even in the worst of times. And they said, man, that guy's got something special. I want what that he has. I'm not going anywhere. If he doesn't leave, I'm not leaving. And he didn't leave. Why didn't Paul and Silas and the others run out? Well, there was a, a jailer who needed to be saved. They suffered so that the jailer could be saved. I don't want to suffer. I don't like suffering. I'm not that fond of submitting. This is the cost of being a disciple. Sacrificing. Submitting. Suffering. Most of us can at least relate to the heartache of being devastated by personal loss or in some cases physical pain, physical suffering. But, you know, there's going to come a day when there will be no more suffering. And we can't forget that. We can't get so short-sighted that we forget the long term. Write down 2 Timothy 3.12. Write this down. 2 Timothy 3.12. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So let's count the cost. It's sacrifice. It's submission. It, to some level, it's suffering. And I would ask you, what has your faith cost you? How has your faith inconvenienced you? The cost of following Jesus and being a servant of Christ. We can read the rest of the text, and it comes under this category, sharing. Sharing. Verse 29 and following, Paul shares the gospel. Then the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, look at this, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. All those in your household who believe on the Lord Jesus will be saved. They spoke the message of the, the, the Lord had called him along with everyone in his house. He took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. So I guess the, the jailer must have taken them, washed them up. Right away, this jailer and all of his family who had believed were baptized. Now we're back to that again. You might want to go ahead and put a square around that word, just like the word the last time it came up. If you need to be baptized, come forward right now, today, and I will baptize you. Be chewing on that. Be thinking about that. That would take a little courage, I think. That was probably not what most people came to church expecting to do today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. After you're saved, be baptized. He brought them up into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had believed God with his entire household. When daylight came, the chief magistrate sent the police to say, release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul. The magistrates have sent orders for you to be released. So come out now and go in peace. And they ran out as quick as they could. Second time, they were going to get out of this stinky jail. 
No, he didn't run out. Why? Why? Well, look at it. Paul said to them, they beat us in public without a trial, although we are Roman citizens. Paul would use his Roman citizenship on more than one occasion as a, as a card, as a chip of authority. And they threw us into jail. They weren't supposed to do that to a Roman citizen. He, he was entitled to a, a trial, due process. And now they're going to smuggle us out secretly? Certainly not. On the contrary, let them come themselves and escort us out. Then the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. My thought on why Paul might have done this would have been to give protection to that Philippian church, that church at Philippi that grew so strong, the one that supported him so much, he was protecting them and supporting them from their infancy, taking some heat off of them from the, from the politicians and the government. And so they came and apologized to them, and escorting them out, they urged them to leave town. After leaving jail, they came to Lydia's house, where they saw and encouraged the brothers and departed, sharing Christ, sharing Christ, communicating the powerful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone, anytime, any way you can. It could be handing them a tract. It could be praying for a server. It could be talking to someone. It could be giving someone food that's hungry. It could be talking to, to someone above you on, on the financial scale, below you on the financial scale, or the social scale, whatever. Sharing Jesus, connecting people with Christ, risking rejection and taking the initiative to share the good news at home, at work, in your community, and all around the world. And thank you for this report today. We have a mission trip being planned that anybody can go on this summer. It'll cost you a week of vacation. It'll cost you some time. We're planning future mission, mission, mission endeavors overseas, specifically to, to South Africa. It will cost you a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to go and share the gospel overseas. After Paul shared, the jailer got saved. That, that's the recipe. After he shared, the jailer got saved. We contacted 13,000 homes and people, probably thousands more than that people, for our block party and all the Easter festivities and all that. About a thousand of them came to our block party, and we ministered to them, and we, we blessed them, and we encouraged them. About half of that many showed up for Easter services the next day, and about nine of those people indicated that they prayed to receive Christ. Man, it's worth it. When we endeavor to go out, people will inevitably come. It, it, is it the majority? Of course not. Is it easy? Absolutely not. Will it cost you something to share the gospel? You better believe it. If you're a math person, if you're a mathematician, here's the formula. Serving equals sacrifice, submission, suffering, sharing. That's what, that's what serving Christ is all about. Is it worth it? You better believe it. You better believe it. When, when we make the sacrifice, God always gives us back more. When we submit, God gives us more freedom. That's the amazing thing. When you break the rules, you get more rules, and you end up getting in jail and getting in handcuffs. And It's amazing, the, 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 the paradox there, when you... When you don't look for freedom, when you, when you look to submit to Christ, all of a sudden there's all this freedom and liberty in the Christian life. When we suffer temporarily, we know that we will experience eternal joy and happiness and unhindered fellowship with the Lord forever. It's worth it, folks. When we share what God has given to us, others get connected with Christ. It's so worth it. So our invitation this morning is very direct. Be saved, just like that jailer, just like Lydia. If you need to give your heart to Jesus, do it today. We exist to connect people with Christ. You're the guest of honor. If you're thinking through this, what, what am I going to do? Do I want to give my heart to Christ? Do I want to be baptized? Listen, just say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Be saved right now. Christians, surrender to God's excellent plan for your life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and chew on that? Oh God, I want to surrender to your excellent plan for my life. Evaluate yourself now while we pray and prepare to sing a song. Surrender to God's excellent plan for your life. And as you evaluate yourself, are you more about sacrificing or settling? Submitting or stubborn? Suffering for the sake of Jesus or playing it safe? Are you more about sharing Or just selfishness? Serving God will always cost you something, but it is more than worth it. If you want to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ right now, I want to encourage you to just pray and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. 
invite him into your life right now. We would love to pray with you about that. We would love to help you with that. We'll have folks here available to pray with you, to help you. And if you've given your heart to Jesus and you say, yes, today, I want to be baptized right now. We're going to sing a little invitation song. Then our congregation is going to, going to worship a little bit. We're going to sing a worship song while we're getting prepared for our baptism. What is God doing in your life? How is God speaking to you this morning? There may be issues, there may be needs that you just want to lay down at the altar. I encourage you just to come and do that. Spend some time alone with the Lord. If you have questions, spiritual questions, needs, come forward. Let someone pray with you and help you with that. If you want to be saved and you want someone to pray with you and show you how to do that, come forward and do that. And If you have been saved and want to come forward and, and, and be baptized today, We'll have a lady ready to help any ladies. We'll have a man ready to help the men. I want to encourage you to do it. Would you stand with me in a very reverent spirit, just as you are? Aren't you thankful that God takes us just as we are and applies his blood to our lives and forgives us for the asking? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you given your heart to Jesus? These are things you need to grapple with. As a point of clarification, Please don't come forward asking to be baptized so that you can be saved. Baptism will not save you. You need to be born again. If you've been born again but have not been baptized, I encourage you to come forward and do it today. If you have a burden on your heart, you want to lay down at the altar, do that. Lord, we do come to you right now as we are, and we thank you, Lord, that you never left us that way, that you don't leave us as we are. You save us, you change us, you cleanse us. And Lord, we've counted the cost and we believe it's more than worth it. None of us want to suffer, Lord, but if that's what it takes, all of us realize we're going to have to sacrifice more than we ever have before and we're grappling with that this morning, submitting to you. Lord, help that one who does not have a submissive spirit. Break his heart, break her heart. Change our hearts, Lord. For the one who says, yes, I know Jesus, but has never shared their faith, ever, Lord, I pray that you would break their heart and give them the courage to change that. Lord, we are ones that say we're willing to pay the price. We've counted the cost, and we decide, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come as God leads you. Don't put it off. Let's sing. Just as I am.
a spirit of prayer at this time as we lead into our next song. We're going to praise the Lord and thank him for what he's done in our life, for those that have committed their lives to God. And Lord, we do thank you. We praise you and we sing of your glory and just how wonderful you are, not for what you've done in our life, but just for who you are. And Lord, we praise you. We serve you. We lift up your name. And we praise you this morning.
Hallelujah. You may be seated. What a wonderful day. What an awesome, awesome, beautiful day outside. Wonderful day in here. Everything we've been talking about today is summed up in two of the lives of individuals that are with us this morning that I want to introduce you to. You know, a few years ago, we built our gym, and we left the Joshua house there, that brick house there for missionaries, international missionaries, to live in when they're home and, and uh, taking a rest or doing a stateside assignment or what have you. And today, uh, we have two extremely, extremely special and honored guests with us, Greg and Wanda. Would you stand? Greg and Wanda are living in that house the next year or so. We're so glad you're here. We appreciate the work you do, and we appreciate that you came and worship with us today, and we look forward to having you come and address the church and letting folks get to know you better. Today, we will go out and be part of this activity. We'll have lunch across the way, and we will go out and visit people who visited us at either the block party or at the uh, Easter service last week. We will follow up on each one. Uh, we've written them letters. Um, we have sent them information. We will visit them personally. We'll call them. We want them to know they belong here, they're special here, and that we care about them and that this is, a, this is a, a loving, warm, and friendly church. So I hope that you will be involved with that. Come get some lunch and then go out with us as we make these visits this afternoon. Mark Perky's come forward, and he has given his heart to Jesus, and today he is coming forward for believer's baptism. Talk with Mark about the fact that baptism does not save you. Baptism of the Holy Spirit when you're saved saves you, but getting water baptized is something we do as an act of obedience, and we identify with Christ who was buried and rose from the grave. Step forward just a little bit like that for that thing. So Mark, have you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and save you? Do you believe on him for your salvation? Yes. Well, based on your public profession and obedience to our Lord's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. As Pastor Pat said a few minutes ago, at the end of this service, we will be going and having lunch across the street. You are invited to do that, and you are also invited to help us follow up on people that came. We have tons of people that visited through the block party and visited our church on Easter, and it's only right of us to go and follow up on them and let them know that we noticed that they were here, that we're glad they came. And so if you would be willing to do that, we would love to have your help. We're going to try to keep it as close to the same teams that we took out the week before Easter as we can so that you guys can kind of work together as a team and stuff like that. But that'll be right across the street. As soon as I say amen, you can head over there. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you that Lord, that even though we sacrifice things for you, and even though you have called us to, to give up things, and it will cost us something to follow you, Lord, that you always make it worth it, that it's worth it to follow you, it's worth it to sacrifice and give things up for you, Lord. And God, I pray that as we give up our time this afternoon, as we give up our naps or our sports games or whatever, Lord, that you would bless our time following up on people who came over Easter, who came to our Easter block party. Lord, that you would just um, help us to realize that you're worth whatever it is that you call us to do. Pray that you would bless the meal that we're about to have in a few minutes, and just bless our Sunday. In your name I pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed.